nature of God. And I got stuck talking against the extreme sovereignty of God teaching that says that God controls everything. That turns people against the Lord. It causes all kinds of heartache. Um, and so anyway, I could, I'm, I'm going to refrain from summarizing what I said because I'll, it'll take too long. So I want to talk about a second thing concerning the nature of God that uh, actually comes from the Bible. Now, I am not saying that the Bible is wrong, but the Bible has been misinterpreted and misunderstood. And because of it, people have come up with this belief that God is a performance-based God. You've got to do all of these things before God moves in your life. In a sense, you've got to earn it. And oddly enough, that comes from the law. And it's because people don't understand the real purpose of the law. So let me just deal with this for a while today and show you from the word things that hopefully will change your image about the true nature of God. In Romans chapter 3, let me start here. But in Romans chapter 3, uh, again, I wish I had time to put it all in its context. Chapter 1 talks about it's the gospel, the good news that's the power of God. But then immediately he started countering religious tradition because religious people were going to say, oh no, you got to let people know how ungodly they are. And he shows in Romans 1, 18 through 20 that everybody already knows that they're a sinner. There's an intuitive knowledge and that you have to harden yourself and deaden yourself and walk away from it. And then chapter 2 he shows that the unbelievers have this intuitive knowledge of God on the inside of them. Chapter 3 shows that the religious people who know the law are doubly guilty because they not only know these things intuitively in their heart, but the Word of God has also condemned them. And then in chapter 3, he kind of summarizes by saying that there's none righteous, no, not one, verse 10, that they, there is none that understands, there is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. And he just keeps saying these things. Verse 19, he says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. And here's the purpose of the law. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And I'm going to share a lot of scriptures with you this morning. I'm going to go through a lot of things. But let me just summarize it by saying that most people misinterpreted the purpose of the law. Most people think that God, that here we were lost, not knowing what we got to do. So God says, all right, let me help you. Let me show you what you've got to do to have relationship with me. That's not the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law, yes, it did give a standard. Here is God's holiness. Here is what he expects. But you can't keep the law. The law was not given for you to keep. The law was given to condemn you. Or as it says right here, the law was given so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Nobody can be in right relationship with God through the law. And somehow or another, religion missed this point. And religion has been preaching, all right, the Bible says you got to do this and this and this. And if you don't do this, God is angry at you and God is going to punish you. And it has left the impression that we have to earn God's favor. The law was given to show you how incapable of ever earning God's favor you were. You can't live holy. It was given to stop your mouth, take away your excuses, make you guilty before God. Verse 20, therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law gave you knowledge of your sin. It pointed your attention in the direction of your sin. It highlighted your sin. And nobody can be justified by the law. And people who are preaching that you got to keep the law, they don't understand what they're saying. That's exactly what it says over in Galatians chapter 3. They don't understand what they say nor whereof they affirm. They don't understand because you can't just keep the majority of it, do the best you can. And if you keep 90% of the laws, well, then that's a passing grade and God will accept you. No, it's either all or nothing. James chapter two, verse 10 says, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. You know, I was raised in a Christian home. 
I got born again when I was eight, and I have been seeking God and trying to serve God my whole life. And because of that, I've never got into some of the things that other people have. I've lived a relatively holy life, but I guarantee you, who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? <laughs> I've sinned, come short of the glory of God. I needed a savior. There isn't a hell number two or a hell number three. I was going to hell. I had sinned and I had to get saved. It took just as much grace of God to forgive me as it did a person who was a rapist, a murderer or anything else. You know, if you understand this properly, it'll answer some questions. Like some of the people who say, well, hell doesn't seem fair. You're going to take this mother here who was faithful to her husband and raised her kids and did the best she could, but she just never made Jesus her savior. And you're going to put her in hell with Hitler with Mussolini and all of these people, that doesn't seem fair. What you're missing is it's not your individual sins that send you to hell. We were all born separated from God. We all had a sin nature. And again, James chapter two, verse 10, if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. It's not these individual sins. It's the sin of rejecting Jesus or ignoring Jesus and thinking you're so good, you don't need him. That's the worst sin of all. Did you know I was a religious Pharisee? And I'm talking about even after I was born again because I was taught that you had to earn God's favor through your goodness. And I was doing the right things, but I was doing it in order for God to accept me. I wasn't approaching God on the basis of Jesus. I was approaching God on the basis of my goodness. And did you know self-righteousness is worse than homosexuality. It's worse than adultery. It's worse than lying or stealing because it's saying that Jesus, I don't need you. I'm good enough on my own. And that's the worst sin of all. The only people that Jesus really came against were the religious Pharisees that were living a relatively holy life. But the problem was they were trusting in themselves and thinking, I don't need a savior. I can save myself. I'm so good. And I tell you, if you understand things properly, it's the rejection of Jesus that sends people to hell. And that is a worse sin than what Hitler did than anybody else. And there isn't a hell deep enough or an eternity long enough to punish people for rejecting Jesus or ignoring Jesus. I tell you, this is God's greatest gift. He gave us the very best that he had. And for people to live a life and not even humble themselves and say, God, I need you. I need your salvation. I can't save myself. That's the worst sin of all. And the problem is, I think it's uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. Could be 1 Corinthians 10, 12, but somewhere around there. It says, but they comparing themselves among themselves and measuring themselves by themselves are not wise. And this is what people were doing. They were comparing themselves with other people. And relative to other people, I think I'm pretty good. But again, who wants to be the best sinner that ever went to hell? We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. God had to bring us out of this deception of self-righteousness. And so how did he do that? It's the law. You think you're good? You think you're holy enough? Let me show you. And he gave, thou shalt not. And I'm not even going to come close to having time to go through all these scriptures. So I'm just going to say some things and you'll have to look them up on your own. But the law actually made sin come alive. Romans chapter 7. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Notice it said sin revived. It didn't say sin came. We were all born with a sin nature. David said in Psalms chapter 51... In sin did my mother conceive me. That did not mean that she was in an adulterous relationship. It just means that we were, all of our parents were sinners. We were born sinners. We were separated from God. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says by one man, or excuse me, it's about verse 15 or 17, somewhere in there. By one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin because all have sinned. So Adam is the one that brought sin and death into this world. It is not your sins that made you a sinner. You were born a sinner. But when you were first born, God doesn't impute sin unto people where there is no law. Romans chapter 5 verse 13 says that. And so until you reach what people call an age of accountability, 
sin is present. You have a sin nature. But if you were to die before you reach this place to where you on, uh, willfully, intentionally sin against God, then you would go to be with the Lord. Sin isn't imputed. That's the reason that a little baby, if they die, a child before they get to be a certain age, or sometimes people who are uh, mentally handicapped and never do get to where they are really in control of their faculties. They could be 30, 40 years old, but if they die, they, sin is not imputed where there is no law. But there is a time when all of a sudden sin revives and you die, and it's when the law comes. And when you intentionally, knowingly violate the law, then that sin is imputed unto you. I can tell you when that happened to me. I was uh, about eight years old. And I know that I didn't just disobey my parents. I just didn't do something that was wrong. I was sinning against God and I knew it. And the very next day I got born again. The very first time I realized that I had intentionally gone against God. Man, my heart smote me and I got born again. But there is a time that sin revives and the thing that makes sin revive is the law. So here are people comparing themselves among themselves and thinking, well, I don't dip or cuss or chew or go with those that do, but I'm better than this person. And so I believe God's going to accept me, you religious Pharisee. You think that you are good enough that you don't need to be forgiven? And you know, I know the things I'm saying. We're talking about a Christian worldview, a biblical worldview. Did you know that sin has been so minimalized today? And there is such an abundance of sin. that Jesus said that because sin will abound, the love of many will wax cold. Our love has waxed cold today. Even Christians today are, are in, uh, indifferent about sin. Sin's not a big deal. But I guarantee you, that's not God's attitude. God created us to be holy. And from God's perspective, there are none righteous. No, not one. All have sinned. And for you to think, well, I'm a relatively good person. I think God's going to accept me. You do not have a biblical worldview. You do not understand what sin has done to the human race. You don't understand the penalty that had to be paid. The wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. And God Almighty came and paid our price and he made the ultimate sacrifice. And for people to ignore this is a huge transgression. You know, if for some reason I loved you enough that I would take one of my sons and kill him to bear your punishment. I can't even relate to that really. But if I loved you enough that I sacrificed my son for you and then you rejected it, said, I don't care, or you just ignored it. Well, thanks for doing it, but it made no difference. I guarantee you that would not please me. <laughs> to make that huge of a sacrifice and it not, I mean, it ought to demand on every single person's part that, man, we give everything we've got to God. I just taught the youth this morning about being a living sacrifice. That is our reasonable service. That's just the normal response to if you understand the price that Jesus paid. But because sin is abounding, people's love is waxed cold. We don't realize how bad sin is. And so people were comparing themselves among themselves and thinking, I'm okay. I know I'm not perfect, but God's going to accept me. God said, you don't realize what's going on. He had to bring us out of our deception. He had to show us how bad our sin was. So how did he do it? All he had to do was say, thou shalt not. And something on the inside of us rose up and said, bless God, I shall. And it showed us immediately that, you know what? We aren't that pure. We aren't that holy. I don't believe that God made us to have all of these rules and regulations. You know, he could have given the 10 commandments to Adam and Eve. Why did he wait 2,000 years? Because that's not the way he wanted us to live. He was giving us unconditional love and acceptance. But after sin entered into the world, uh, instead of Cain being killed, Genesis chapter 4, God put a mark in his forehead to protect the first murderer on the face of the earth. But then Cain's great, great, great grandson, Lamech, came along and he killed a man in self-defense 
And so he thought he was more worthy of protection than Cain was. He began to compare himself with other people, see, who had sinned. And because of it, he said, surely God will have then Lamech 70 and sevenfold. The only thing wrong with that, God didn't say that. Lamech said it. Lamech was taking and comparing himself and saying, I'm better than Cain, and so God's going to protect me. And sin was beginning to destroy the human race, and mankind wasn't even aware of how deadly our sins are. Boy, the things I'm saying right here are so contrary to our society. Did you know 50 years ago when I was a kid, there were homosexuals. I had a guy right after my dad died that came and it came to my mother and he wanted to take me camping because my dad was dead and he was going to be a father to me and he was stepping in and wanting to help me. And man, I just thought, man, this is awesome. But my mother had enough sense to go ask the pastor and the pastor told her and she wouldn't let me go and, and she never explained it to me. I didn't know. Now I understand what it was. This guy was a homo 50 years ago. But he was masquerading. They didn't have parades about it. They didn't brag about it. They didn't make you sit there and adopt their lifestyle. They were there, but they were under the radar. But now they have parades. They brag about it. They put the White House in the rainbow colors. Sin is running rampant and people, because they're listening to other people, are saying, well, it's really not so wrong. No, it is wrong. It caused Sodom and Gomorrah to be destroyed. God hasn't changed. He doesn't change. You can change your standards, but that isn't going to change God. And so how does God bring us out of this? The law. The law gave us a right standard. Think about before the Bible was given. People were just kind of muddling through life and thinking, well, Cain got by with this. Lamech got by with this. And on and on. And so people were just living in a terrible lifestyle. God had to do something to give us a proper standard. You know, if the way you establish right and wrong is relative, it's relative to other people, relative to society. What does society say is right and wrong? Uh, you know, the only example I've thought of that really ministers to me is like if we were all in quicksand right now. And if we were all sinking, but we were sinking at the same rate and you looked over at everybody else and they're in about the same mess that you're in. And so you just think, well, this is normal. But if somebody was to establish some fixed point on something solid that wasn't sinking and they had some measurement there and you were looking at that, you could say, man, I don't relative to other people. I may be OK, but man, relative to this standard, I'm sinking. If I don't do something, I'm going to be destroyed. That's what the law was. The law was God's original purpose, the way God made us to be. And the purpose of giving us the law wasn't to help us by making us, you know, overcome all of these problems. It was to condemn us. It was to show us our sin. Just for time's sake, I'm going to quote a lot of stuff. But 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7 says, The law was a ministration of death written and engraven in stones. Some people will say, well, the ceremonial part of the Old Testament law, you know, has passed away, but not the Ten Commandments. And man, I hadn't got time to put all this in its context. There is a right use of the Ten Commandments today. And so I am not against the Ten Commandments, but they'll say the ceremonial law passed away, but the Ten Commandments, you still got to do all of these things or God is going to judge you. It says the ministration of death written and engraven in stones. What part of the law was written and engraven in stones? The Ten Commandments. That has passed away for the purpose of you being justified with God. The law is not made for a believer. 1 Timothy chapter 1 says the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless, for the disobedient, for whoremongers, for adulterers, for all of these kind of things. There is a purpose of the law. It is to point us, it shows us our sin relative to God and it makes us condemned and guilty. 2 Corinthians 3, 9 says the ministration of condemnation talking about the law. So the law killed, the law condemned, the law gave knowledge of sin, it stopped your mouth. 
It uh, made sin come alive on the inside of you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 56 says, The strength of sin is the law. The law strengthened sin. It didn't strengthen you in your battle against sin. It strengthened sin. Man, I haven't got time to explain this. I'll just say it. Hopefully I'll plant a seed. You'll go search it out. But it didn't say it's the strength of sins, plural. It's the strength of sin, singular, which is talking about the sinful nature. The law literally strengthened the, the hold of your carnal, sinful nature over you. If you take a person and if you go to preaching, thou shalt not commit adultery. If you commit adultery, God's angry at you. The law makes sin come alive. You will make people start lusting for the very thing that you command them not to do. It's counterintuitive. Most people think, oh no, the law uh, restrains people. Well, it restrains them in the sense that they're fearful of judgment. And that will restrain sin. I didn't go commit the sins that many of you did because I was under the law and I was fearful of judgment. So I didn't do what you did but I bet you that sin had more dominion over me than it had over you. And some of you may think, oh, I don't know. You know, when I was a kid, I could see a word of profanity scribbled on a stall in a public restroom. And I'd spend two or three days repenting and asking God to forgive me for even having that thought come across my mind. I didn't write it. I just saw it. And I would be condemned and guilty. I used to dream that I had smoked a cigarette and that I got uh, arrested and they turned me over to my mother. And after my mother beat me, I wound up in hell, burning in hell. I dreamed that at least once or twice a year. I was tormented at the thought of smoking a cigarette. I never smoked one, but just the desire to smoke one would make me condemned. I know some of you think, man, you were messed up. <laughs> and I was that's the way religion will do and in the Baptist church they didn't call it mixed swimming they called it mixed bathing boys and girls couldn't swim together in public because that was sin and man I never did that and, the, and there was a couple of times I, I did and I was so guilt ridden I thought God was going to kill me I only missed one church service in my whole life. And that was when I was about 14 years old, something like this. And a, a girl invited me over to her house. There was going to be other people there, her parents. When I got there, her parents weren't there. There was a couple of other groups of kids and they were dancing. And man, I was so smitten. I might have lasted 10 minutes and I called my brother and he picked me up and I was at that church service before it was over. I didn't miss the whole service. And I lost the girlfriend and everything else. But man, I wasn't going to be in this den of iniquity. Kids there with, without parents and they were dancing. No way was I going to do that. So you know what? The condemnation did keep me from doing some of the things that you did, but I felt guilty about things that you never even felt guilty about. Sin destroyed me. I was sin conscious. I felt so unworthy. Many of you that were out committing sexual acts and doing dope and getting drunk, you never were as guilt ridden as I was. It's absolutely true. So you know what? I praise God for my background because I don't have some of the pains and the hurts and the broken relationships and stuff that you do. But I had a lot of stuff I had to overcome, all of the guilt and the condemnation. And I needed grace just the same as a person had been out living in sin. I remember when I spoke at uh, Lake Okeechobee in Florida and it was at this rehabilitation center that Mickey Evans ran. And everybody there were rapists and murderers. And it was in the middle of a swamp. If you got outside of the compound, the gators would get you. And so they released people to this place so that they couldn't escape. They were, in a sense, kept there. And anyway, I spoke there. And these were all rapists and murderers. I mean, uh, Murph the Surf went through there. People that killed lots of people. They were bad dudes. And there was about 150 of them. 
And I remember getting up and starting my testimony by telling them, I've never taken a drink of liquor. I've never smoked a cigarette. I've never said a word of profanity in my life. And these (laughs) rapists and murderers were looking at me. And I said, but you know what? Self-righteousness is the biggest sin of all. And I lived under such guilt and condemnation. And man, it's the grace of God that set me free. And I started sharing with them about how God had set me free. And did you know, it caused a revival. Those guys were on their face before the Lord. They actually taped it and made it mandatory for every person that went there had to listen to this because it put things into perspective for them. They thought they were worse than other people. And I convinced them I was worse than any of you because I was self-righteous. I'm telling you, we, we need to change things. And this is what the law will do. If you don't have a standard then people will sit there and compare themselves among themselves and stuff. And, and Satan just has total access to you. Romans chapter 6 verse 16 says that know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Even though God isn't imputing sin unto us, even though under the new covenant we are new creatures sin will still give Satan a direct inroad into your life. You can take what I'm saying here and say, man, this is great news. Man, God loves me independent of my performance. I'm not under the law. And so praise God, I'm going to go out and rob a bank. I need money. I'll rob a bank. I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that I can rob a bank and get by with a million dollars and I will not get caught. And you could do that and guess what? If you're born again, God still loves you. He's not going to impute that sin unto you. And the whole time you're sitting in your jail cell, rotting away, (laughs) you could have a great relationship with God and you could feel his presence and he could speak to you and God will treat you just as if you never sinned. But I guarantee you, there are consequences to that sin. You are giving Satan an inroad into your life and he will come to steal, kill and to destroy So even though I'm not under the law and it's not for me, it's for people that don't know the Lord, there still is benefit to me to understanding the law. And there is benefit for our nation. Not everybody in this nation, the vast majority of people in this nation do not know the Lord. And we need to have a godly standard of what right and wrong is. We need to have the Ten Commandments up. Not for Christians to be able to try and relate to God on the basis of that. No, because it's my faith in Jesus that makes me accepted with God. But we need to still be uh, proclaiming what a proper standard of right and wrong is. There is still benefit to having the law. But the law made sin come alive. You know, when I was a kid, we used to, you know, try and get people to do things. You know, just kid stuff. You try and... Like I remember one time trying to get a kid to walk across a log, across a creek, and it was wet. And I knew he would fall. He knew he would fall. And so he said, no. And I said, you can't do it. You're a sissy. I said, I double dog dare you. When you double dog dare somebody in Texas, they had to do it. So this kid, because he was... He was challenged, he did it, and he fell in the creek, and we knew it was going to happen. And he knew he shouldn't do it. He knew it wasn't smart. But somebody said, thou shalt not. And there's something on the inside of us that when they say, thou shalt not, something just says, bless God, I shall. (laughs) It makes sin come alive. You know, I was running a race right here in Woodland Park. It was a 10K race, 6.2 miles. And I was only a quarter of a mile from the finish line And I had turned in my best time that I'd ever done. It was a personal record, but I was out of juice. And I was a quarter of a mile from the finish line, and a guy started to pass me. And he could tell that as he started to get in front of me, I tried to keep up with him. I'm a competitor. My dad taught me that second place is first loser. I'm not a sore loser. It doesn't make me mad or anything, but I guarantee you, I have never thrown a game of anything in my life. When my kids were one year old, we played tiddlywinks. I beat them as bad as I could. I told my kids, if you ever beat me, you beat me. I'll never throw a game of anything in my life. I am a competitor. I love competing. So anyway, this guy started to pass me and I tried to keep up, but I couldn't do it. 
So he got about two yards in front of me and he looked back over his shoulder and real sarcastically, he said, you could do better than that. And I mean, it's just like the Incredible Hulk or something. I don't know what happened, but I turned on the afterburners. I bet you I beat that guy as far as from here to the back of this auditorium. And I crossed that finish line and Jamie was there and I passed out. She had to drag me out of the way. I don't know where that came from, but there's just something that when you say thou shalt not, something says, bless God, I shall. And God knew that. And that's the reason he gave the law. It wasn't to set you free. It was to show you how messed up you were. I heard a story about a guy saying, that if you could imagine a bull laying in a pasture and this bull gets convicted and says, you know, I'm mean. I charge every person that comes through this pasture. I shouldn't be doing things like this. I think I'm going to quit. From now on, I'm not a bull. I'm a lamb. And so he's just laying there thinking, I am a lamb. You know what? That's deception. You can't change just by thinking. So you got to be born again. Amen. And so this bull sitting here thinking, I'm a lamb now. All you got to do, that bull's got to be brought out of its deception. So what do you do? You just wave a red flag in front of it. And it's not the red flag that made the bull bad or mad. It was the nature that was inside of that bull. And all that red flag did was draw out what was there. That's the reason that God gave the law. Not so that you could keep it because you can't keep it. He gave the law to show you how incapable of keeping it. So it would make sin come alive and that it would shut you up under the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Uh, Galatians chapter 3, I believe verse 19 says that. The law was given to make sin come alive on the inside of you and dominate you so that you would say, Oh God, I can't do it. Have mercy on me. And that's what the Lord was after the whole time. But religion has misinterpreted and it says, no, this is who God is. And unless you do this and do this and do this, God won't answer your prayer. God won't fellowship with you. God won't bless you. And that thinking has led so many people into a wrong image of who God is. Amen. You know, if you were here yesterday, our last, I don't know when it, it was yesterday morning. I gave that example about this horse that I broke and I didn't realize what was going to happen to that horse, that horse got a totally wrong impression of me thinking that I was a terrible person by something I did. It didn't understand that I was doing this, trying to save that horse's life. Instead, I'm sure that horse just thought I was trying to kill it. And it was fearful of me and it complied and it would do what I told it to, but it, it wasn't right. It had a wrong impression of me. In a sense, that's what the law did. The law stopped the amount of sin. It limited Satan's access to us because we weren't sinning as much, but it also made sin come alive. The sin we had committed, it destroyed us. It condemned us. It killed us. And you cannot have a good relationship with God living under the Old Testament law because the law, if you do 100, if there were 100 things that you were supposed to do and if you did 99 right, the law will never issue you a compliment and say you did 99 right, try again. You did better than last time. No, it'll just show you you did one thing wrong. It'll never compliment you. It'll never build you up. It'll always condemn you. It, the purpose of it is condemnation and death and to show you the, the law, your sin. And once you come to Jesus, God doesn't want you knowing that stuff. This is the reason God didn't give the law for 2,000 years. He could have given the law to Adam and Eve, but he waited 2,000 years because he didn't want us to know how ungodly we were. He knew that our heart would condemn us. The moment that Adam and Eve saw that they had sinned, they ran from God. They hid they should have run to God. But see, that's what the knowledge of good and evil does. It condemns you. And it's necessary. It's necessary that we understand our sinfulness so that we quit trusting in ourselves and we lose all hope of self-salvation. There is a godly purpose to the law, even for a Christian. But it is totally incapable of producing right standing with God. It's, I read that verse, Romans 3.20, by the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. The law wasn't given to make you right with God. It was given to show you how unright with God you were. 
And there is still a purpose for that. But once you come to the Lord, you've got to get away from the condemnation, the guilt that comes through the law. It says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2, that we should not have any more conscience of sin. You should not be sin conscious. But the law makes you sin conscious. The law only points out what you've done wrong. You know, when I was still under the law, this is after I had my experience with the Lord, I spent one whole day fasting and praying and I read from Mark. I don't know why, but I started in Mark all the way through the book of Revelation. I spent, I think it was 14 or 15 hours and I read all of the New Testament except Matthew. And man, at the end of that, I was feeling pretty good. Like, God, I read nearly all of the New Testament in one day and I was just praising God for my goodness and what I had done and thinking, God, this is bound to please you. And you know what? I had the thought come to me. You were up 16 hours. You wasted one hour. And I went to bed feeling like, oh God, I'm sorry. I wasted an hour. That's the law. The law won't compliment you on the 15 hours you spend in the word. It'll focus on the one hour you messed up. And I can tell you, you're always going to mess up. You're always going to be doing something wrong. If you're living under the law, you have no confidence. You'll just have nothing but condemnation. The law is what ministered condemnation. Sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. If you are under the law, sin will have dominion over you. That was the purpose of it, was to make sin come alive and condemn you and defeat you. So anyway, I'm saying all of these things to say that you know what? The law has been misinterpreted and misrepresented by the church to make people feel like I've got to do these things before God will love me, before God will answer my prayer. And that wasn't the purpose of the law. The law was given to show you that you can't save yourself. Quit trusting in yourself. Ask God for mercy. He's full of mercy. I heard a story about a guy that went to heaven. And when he got to heaven, the angel met him. And he says, what's your name? And uh, anyway, he told him his name. And he says, you know what? We got to give you a test before we can let you in here. And so he says, well, that's fine. He says, I was a good Christian man. I, I'm sure I could pass this test. He says, all right, you got to get a hundred points. And he says, no problem. So he asked him the first question. He says, did you go to church? And he said, yeah, I, here's my attendance pins. I never missed. <laughs> and he says, that's worth half a point. And he goes, half a point. <laughs> And he goes, were you faithful to your wife? Oh, yeah, I was faithful to my wife. I never cheated on my life. He says, that's worth one point. Did you tithe? Oh, yeah, here's my tithing record. That's worth half a point. Anyway, after a bunch of questions, the guy had five points. And he says, my God, if this is the way you're going to grade me, he says, Lord, have mercy on me. And the angel says, welcome in. Amen. <laughs> that was the purpose of the law. The purpose of the law is to get you to quit trusting in yourself. And did you know, I've had people come by the hundreds or thousands and they say, would you please pray for me? I'm doing everything I know and God hadn't healed me yet. I fast, I pray, I study the word, I pay my tithes, I go to church. Why isn't God healing me? Because you just told me why. Because you didn't point to what Jesus did for you. You pointed to what you have been doing and you think that if you do enough good stuff, and that earns you a star and you get one, you know, good, good answer to prayer for every star that you earn. You're trying to earn favor with God. And that's the reason that you haven't seen it yet. God doesn't give any of us what we deserve. If he gave you what you deserved, you'd go to hell. And some of you, oh, I'm good. Again, you're comparing yourself to me or somebody else. Compared to God's standard, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The moment you start saying, it's not fair. God, why haven't you done this? It reveals that you are under the law and that's the very reason you haven't received. It's the grace of God that you haven't got what you deserved. You got to start operating in grace. So if you don't understand what I've said, you misinterpret the law, it will give you this impression that God is holding back and God is saying, not until you fast more. Not until you get rid of smoking. Not until you quit cussing. Not until you quit doing this. I won't move in your life. That's not the way that God is. 
God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet. God's never had anybody that deserved an answer to prayer yet. I've had people come up before and say, oh, this person, if anybody ever deserved the things of God, it was this person. That just shows that you do not understand anything about God. There's none of us, none righteous, no, not one, talking about in yourself. Nobody deserves the goodness of God. And that was the purpose of the law was to reveal that so that we'd quit trusting in ourselves. If you've not understood the things I've talked about, I'd encourage you to get a series that I've got entitled The True Nature of God. And it'll go into a lot more detail and give you the scriptures on it. But see, this gives people a wrong impression of God. And because of it, they don't doubt that God can heal or that God can do that. They just doubt that he will do it because their own heart condemns them. They're living under the law and they know that I don't deserve it. Well, you don't deserve it. But the good news is you don't get what you deserve. You get what Jesus purchased for you and all you got to do is humble yourself and receive it by faith. Amen. That's good news. Praise the Lord. So Father, we love you and thank you for sending us Jesus to cleanse us, to set us free, to give us access to you. But Father, also thank you for the law that it revealed to us our own self-righteousness, our own unworthiness, so that we would quit trusting in ourselves and boasting in ourself. Father, thank you for the way that you have revealed yourself. And I pray for anybody here today who, Father, misinterpreted the law and all of these commands and thought that they had to do all of these things to be accepted. I pray that you would take the things that I've said and use it to change their impression, to open up their heart, to let the love of God flow into them without being restricted by their performance. Father, I pray that people would just open up and receive this love of God. Thank you, Jesus. So, Father, we agree and we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.